save the everybody uh, okay I uh, guess we'll get started here I'm the going last here so I'm sure everybody's uh, heard a lot of uh, great talks already um, I'm basically going to repeat lots of things that people have already said here but hopefully in a different context um, I'm talking here about uh, blender and undergraduate technology education uh, it's uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through some formal stuff at the beginning and then rapidly lose any sense of structure and just randomly talk to people about stuff. So uh, it'll all kind of crank through my deck of slides here and then stop doing that and have a real conversation after a little bit here. Um, so uh, the thing there's a case study, the use of Blender as cornerstone technical, technical production courses, blah, blah, blah. So I'm at, uh, uh, in the Emerging Media Technologies program inside of the Entertainment Technology Department, inside of the College of Technology and Design, inside of New York City College of Technology that's inside of City University of New York. If that sounds like some sort of bureaucratic hellscape, it's, it's a state school, so that's how it works. Um, so it's a large, complex uh, place, so I also give a nice little summary of things. Uh, how we use free software to teach our students uh, skills to make real money, or Blender 3D equals money. Um, uh, my name is Damon Baker. I'm assistant professor of interactive entertainment and emerging media technologies. Um, there's all my contact information and stuff. Uh, basically, I'm I teach in a, uh, a technology program. Like we're not like a fine arts background or anything at all. We we're designed to uh, give students a bachelor's degree. They get a real education, but. Um, we're, we're teaching them to be technologists, like they're, they're supposed to be hands-on with technology and supposed to be able to get a job when they graduate, unlike art school. Um, so the idea is that students are going to learn real employable skills, move out into industry, um, and part of the way that we try to do that, and this is just one of these randomly finding, I'm going to skip around inside my presentation here, I, I found a link, somebody sent me earlier, if it will, there to a random dumb story in Wired, but Wired's talking about American schools are training kids for a world that doesn't exist. I'm trying not to do that. And there's this, this bit down here that I really liked. Um, it says, you know, uh, the way basically people are doing it, that a lot of schools are doing it, is that we learn and then after this we do. We go to school, then we go to work. That doesn't work. Uh, you don't learn stuff and then go do it. You do stuff, break things, set stuff on fire, uh, you know, that sort of stuff, and then you, you figure out how to do it. You have to be doing it while you're, while you're learning it, uh, not, you know, some sort of magical learning experience, and then you go do it. So at least that's the approach we've taken. We have these uh, technical production classes. Now I'll have to get back into my presentation here. Um, and uh, the skip board. Uh, so the technical production classes are basically just guided workshops. The students work on projects. We, we determine what they're, what they're going to work on. They're not just sort of free to work on stuff they're given a task to do, uh, put into teams, and then we try to help them out with things as much as possible while they still do the work. And the work that they do, at least in my, my, my classes of it, have been Blender. We use Blender extensively uh, for a variety of different purposes, often for things that Blender's never really built to do. Um, I end up doing a lot of uh, my own research is in uh, human-computer interaction with virtual worlds. So uh, we do a lot of like software development, adding, uh, you know, uh, integrating support for like the Oculus Rift and Leap Motion and various other uh, interfaces with Blender Game Engine. Uh, we'd done that for a while, then we realized we were spending all of our time installing all these uh, different libraries and stuff, so we started adding in integration using uh, some other tools, uh, the Conda uh, packaging system out of the Anaconda distribution, etc. So we start branching off into more software development projects and less of like making models of things. So uh, we're working with the underlying technologies. So that's sort of what we do there. Um, I'm going to give away the ending at the beginning in case I don't get to the ending, so then I've got the ending out of the way so I can move on. Um, so it's, uh, you can either view them as main themes of the presentation or, spoiler alert, uh, this, uh, basically the things that I'm going to come back to, and this has been stated in a couple other people's talks that I've seen here, there's some things that I think are real strong strengths of Blender that people are often apologetic about. There's often this like, you know, it's really good for free software. I'm like, no, it's really good because it's free software. That's amazing. Um, the Blender's licensing lets students work with Blender, not the student licensed version of Blender, not the toy crippled version of Blender, not the version that you can't pick up a contract job over weekends and make real money doing version. It's just 
Blender. Um, so there's there's one license, and it makes it really great. My students are able to actually do real work while they're in school. This comes back to that: not learn and then do, but then do and then do some more and do some more and learn while you're doing it. Um, uh, Blender's open development model gives students a window into an industry scale software development project. Um, often people end up learning how to make Hello World in like 40 languages, and that's kind of useful, but that's not really what you'd really do in a real software environment. So being able to see how Blender has been developed, how we sometimes have, you know, like version 2.72 comes out, and then 2.72a, and then 2.72b, and be able to talk to my students about how that, you know, why that happens uh, is, is, uh, is a really useful thing. My students have been able to be, you know, sort of spying on the whole development process and it happens there. So they get a feeling for what the kind of environments they're likely to work in will be like. And uh, it provides unique opportunities for introducing students to technical fields beyond just 3D modeling, rendering, animation stuff, because it builds in so many other projects, particularly Python-related projects. Uh, the previous talk kept boiling down to, you should learn Python. And that's what I tell my students all the time. You should learn Python. It's great. Um, it's used in a lot of different other areas, and so Blender uh, not only uh, has stuff it's built on its own, but built on top of other existing projects, all of these nice things coming from industry, you know, open subdiv, subdiv, and things like that, um, but uh, also just the fact that it's built on top of Python. Uh, I'll get some more into that, but uh, I, I have a lot of students who come in originally thinking they want to be like, maybe like some sort of 3D modeler, and they're not really good at it, and if you're not really good at being a 3D modeler, there's not really a job at being a mediocre 3D modeler, um, but when they get to working with Blender, I've been able to to steer them into a variety of different programming areas because the same stuff that they're learning to uh, make uh, Blender do what they want can be made to make web servers do whatever they want and a variety of other things. Uh, Python's uh, broad applications in lots of areas makes it a, a great starting point. Okay, so uh, goal of this presentation, provide real world examples of how Blender's openness is a strength, not a weakness, and when it comes to preparing students for jobs in a variety of technical fields. Um, so that's, you know, what I'm uh, wanting to do here. Um, I'm going to do this then by uh, uh, referring back to sort of three examples. So we're in Amsterdam, you may have noticed this. Um, and while I was on the way over here, I realized that the three things I'm going to talk about a lot are really got their start from Amsterdam. Um, OK, so these things started in Amsterdam. Blender, of course, I'm going to talk about Blender because we're at a Blender conference. Um, but Python also from here as well. So, And then the other things, since I mentioned I'm from uh, New York College of Technology inside of the City University of New York, uh, New York City got its start here as well. So we well, may have known as you know, New Amsterdam. Um, person made a, and uh, person made a book about this. There's this uh, island the center of the world, Russell Shorto. Uh, he uh, here's all the links to all the information. There's an interview that he gave uh, that I'm pulling this stuff from, basically saying that you know yes, actually it was New Amsterdam before, um, and uh, that uh, that happened basically about the same time the Pilgrims showed up. The Dutch and the English were kind of competing with each other, so when the English got control of it, they just sort of ignored all that previous history. But it still had its impact. Um, the Dutch Republic was an open and tolerant society that uh, brought together lots of people, and uh, when they formed a colony there, they kind of kept going with that. Uh, New York became a place that uh, is generally uh, open and open for trade and very, you know, accepting of multiple cultures, didn't sort of wipe out everything there. Um, I like this line here because, you know, 20 years after New York City, has reported 18 different languages being spoken, and, and this is a time when the population is no more than 500. I did a survey in one of my classes. We had 16 students, and we had 17 different languages spoken. So we're doing pretty good. Um, one of my kids speaks five languages, though, so that was the one I sort of put over the top. Um, but this sort of tradition there has kind of kept going. I teach in a very, uh, you know, my students are all either recent immigrants themselves or children of recent immigrants. They're almost always the first person in their family who's went to college, definitely the first generation that's went to college. Um, they're, uh, you know, wanting to be able to move into programming jobs and technology jobs and not like working McDonald's. So. Um, uh, I have a large, you know, this sort of uh, culture of openness kind of makes sense for us here. In fact, here's the official seal of New York City. I had to put the you know, attribution here. Um, the uh, person on this side there is not actually playing with the yo-yo, as I first assumed, and that is not a television antenna sticking out up there over the left-hand side. Those are tools for navigation. You may notice that the official shield in the middle does have a windmill, of course, and the uh, barrels there are for uh, flour that was milled with the windmill, and the beavers are not attacking the windmill, as I had originally hoped, but were... Uh, uh, one of the major exports from New York City originally when it was a Dutch colony was uh, uh, beaver pelts. There is also, notice the uh, one of the Lenape Indians being shown on there. You know, I'm going to say this really, really as clearly as possible. Colonialism 
bad, bad idea, bad things, terrible horrible things happened. But under the Dutch, there was not as bad as a lot of other places, like, say, the Plymouth Colony. There was less wars of extermination, more of like, you have beaver pelts, we'll, we'll trade you things for them. That was that was the the main interaction there. Now, of course, in the process, bringing smallpox and a bunch of other things. So it wasn't great, but it could have been a lot worse, and it was a lot worse in other places. So. The sort of culture of, of, of openness carries another something else. So now for something completely different, uh, obligatory Monty Python joke to talk about Python. Uh, Python is you know, one of the core things that's in, in Blender. It makes, what makes Blender amazing and magical and good. In fact, we saw from the last talk, the uh, main thing came out from that was, you know, learn Python. It's great. Uh, Python's used in a lot of other stuff, though. Uh, Python gets used very heavily in like the scientific computing world. Um, I've done a lot. I moved back and forth between kind of fine arts, visual arts world, and uh, scientific computing as far as my own background and things. So um, all these things build on top of uh, Python, the various uh, scientific computing distributions up there, and then various interactive formats based around IPython. So there's uh, the Beaker project and various other things. There's a lot of really good things out there that. Um, Particularly, kind of like the data science world has just all adopted Python. That's like the language there, um, and they've uh, moved away from a lot of other tools. Like I actually used to work for Wolfram Research at one point in time. I love Mathematica. Mathematica is awesome. It's amazing, but um, you can do a lot of the stuff that you used to be able to do in Mathematica in in, in Python. So um, it's a great tool for me to, for my students to be able to move off into other areas. I've had students who came in thinking they're going to be 3D modelers who are now making more money than I do because they work for some hedge fund. So, um, and they'll probably get bored with that, but once they have enough money in the bank, they can do whatever they want to. So, uh, so that's the, the things that I'm coming back to here is that, you know, uh, Blender is built on top of, it's an open system built on top of, I'll put up the obligatory links for all these things, you're going to follow any of those up. Um, it's an open system built on top of other open systems, like they all interpenetrate and interwork with each other. Um, it builds on a lot of other strengths, uh, and it's a great place for learning. It's a great tool to get started being able to move into a lot of different areas, um, and also it's you know, it, it is a professional industry strength tool. You can make it do a lot of things. Its openness is a great strength, not something we should be apologizing about, especially in education. It's been amazing to be able to have, you know, when something doesn't work the way someone wants it to, to be able to go through the source code and find exactly the line of code that says, that's why this button doesn't do what you think it does, and be able to show it to them. Uh, being able to teach all the way down, even going down to the, the lower level C parts of it has been great. Um, I don't have to do that all the time, but knowing that I can do it has been really useful. Um, and for my students, being able to sort of be able to see how a software project comes together, uh, as opposed to just sort of it appears magically on the day that the releases come out, has been really key and really useful. Um, special thanks here to my students and my various classes, and especially to Dave Alvarado, who got me the uh, image that I put out there at the beginning there. Uh, he's working on a culmination project, which is basically a game in Blender, so he got me a random uh, screenshot of that. He's really good. Hire him. So um, that's the sort of formal part of my uh, presentation here, if I can get this to let go of the screen. Um, Basically, what it comes down to is we use Blender as kind of a starting point, a thing that we can build other stuff on as opposed to like a, a prepackaged uh, uh, tool, uh, which is a, a key thing for as a teaching point pedagogically for my students to be able to you know, show them that you can change stuff. Code is a thing that you write, and it's, it's not just sort of a thing that you buy from someone. And you can be one of those people that writes that is really, really key. I mean, in the, not everybody in here was, was in for the previous uh, talk, but uh, talking about the Python the Pi menus and that they're just little very, very simple Python scripts. And you can, you know, rework the environment really, really uh, rapidly. You know, I was working with one of my students and showing him things like, you know, you mouse over things in the, in the Blender editor and uh, it shows you exactly which function is being called when you click that button. And then I was able to, you know, open up the script that runs that menu and edit it inside of Blender and uh, save it and be able to make changes on the fly. Uh, that blows their minds and that's kind of my job, you know, being able to, to you know, uh, really change how they think about things is really key for uh, being able to make stuff happen. Uh, you know, they come in often with unrealistic ideas about their own skills, unrealistic ideas about what uh, things will be compensated. I mean, but, you know, they're, they're teenagers. I mean, I think back to me at like 17, and I wouldn't have trusted me at 17 to butter toast. So, um, you know, that's, I think it's part of my job is to help uh, be able to challenge some assumptions they may have about like what software is and whether they can program or not. A lot of them come in and convince they can't do this programming thing because that's something that special people elsewhere or some other place do. And I make them do it, and then they learn that they can do it. So uh, it's a really, really useful, really, really powerful tool uh, on multiple levels, not 
just on it lets me make cool 3D stuff, which it does. It makes amazingly cool 3D stuff. Um, it, it's a great way to lure students into more technical areas because those technical areas are open to you as opposed to other 3D environments uh, made by, say, Autodesk. Uh, that stuff is sort of closed off, off underneath, and you sort of reach a limit to what you can do. So. Um, uh, Blender has been just absolutely key, uh, not just as a thing that we teach, you know, I'm actually not really teaching like Blender 3D modeling is not like a skill that I want them to be able to put on their resume necessarily, it would be a great one, but um, the other stuff that comes along with it is really, really empowering for the students on multiple levels. So it's been a, a great, great source uh, for my kids. Uh, we, you know, we're working on a variety of different projects. Um, we've been playing around with uh, a lot of scientific computing stuff, particularly the uh, Conda build system out of Anaconda distribution is amazing for handling dependencies for sort of complex projects if you depend on a pile of C and Fortran code or whatever and you want to have a nice friendly Python interface to it and you don't want to have to mess with uh, doing a bunch of uh, uh, you know installing a bunch of libraries and stuff you can just make Conda take care of it for you assuming someone's written a Conda recipe so my kids have been doing that for a variety of different things like adding Oculus Rift support to Blender we've got that down to where you type in a command and it just sort of appears leap motion things like that we basically every semester pick a different interface and bolt it onto uh, Blender Game Engine so we keep adding new ways to interact with it and each semester we build on the previous uh, classes stuff so now we can use the Connect with Blender Game Engine and we can use the Leap Motion with the Blender Game Engine and we can use the Oculus Rift and we'll just keep adding things to it and students learn that you know the work that they've done in class matters because we can do that now because the previous semester you guys did that and it, you know they take ownership and pride in their own work so um, being able to show that kind of stuff is probably, I think, the most important things they're going to get out of uh, learning. I mean, they'll learn how to you know, make models and do stuff. I mean, that's that's also important, too. But uh, the other stuff that comes along with it, uh, Blender has been an amazing tool for uh, those kind of, not necessarily soft skills, but larger, more complex uh, elements there uh, in, in as part of their education. So uh, it's been a key part of our education thing. I can take questions, or I can continue high-speed babbling on. I don't really, I kind of smushed my, uh, uh, pr uh, presentation into the time allotted there, and uh, I realize everybody's been here at the end of a long day. Has anybody got any questions about anything? Anything? Everybody doing it there? Yes. Is uh, a tool uh, like Blender not way too complex to begin with? So, so the question. Uh, mm -hmm. I did uh, studies in, in um, processing, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. Yeah, our intro, our intro programming class is processing. We use processing to get them started with it. Um, it's a it's a great tool, especially getting to understand like the you know the, the text you type gets turned into into, into programs. So we uh, use that to introduce basic programming skills. Usually start them off doing that, and then we show them like, look, it generates Java underneath the hood, and and they can they can start playing with that. Um, that gets them started. It's definitely a good place to, you know, I, I wouldn't like necessarily begin with like Python scripting inside of Blender. There's a lot of stuff going on and you want to kind of start with something that's just the code that you write. We also have them since uh, processing environment so nice. Uh, the Arduino environment as well is 90% the same. So once they've taken the intro processing class, we have them take a physical computing class that I teach and they build stuff on a microcontroller, which is kind of nice because it's only, there's no operating system or anything. There's just the code that you wrote. So it's a really great thing for, for learning because you don't have to worry about like something else unrelated to your code is broken and that's why it's not going. It's your code is broken and you so, need to fix it. So uh, yeah, usually they come through like we have a kind of Bauhausian kind of uh, you know core uh, you know Vorkos kind of thing. When they come in, they, everybody does a little bit of programming. Everybody has a little bit of uh, basic media skills. Everybody has a little bit of electronics. Get them introduced to stuff, and then once they go from that, they go into either focusing. They focus on their own specialties, but everybody works together on these large team projects. And with me, those projects are usually done in Blender. So kids come in, they do like four semesters of these team projects, and when they begin with it, they don't understand the programming parts of it. And they're kind of mystified and terrified of it. But since we've been doing this for several semesters now, there are their other classmates that aren't mystified and terrified of it. They've got the hang of it, and they're able to kind of help teach them and move them along with it. So it's a really great way, once they've kind of gotten their feet with the basic ideas of scripting and programming, to put them in there. Mostly they start using the Blender interface to begin with. I give them, you know, the beginners get given a lot of kind of chores to do with stuff. And then after a while, they start modifying that interface or adding things to it or doing other stuff with it. So by the time that they graduate, they've made it into 
whatever they want to make it into. So uh, a lot of our kids have started using, this is our, really our fourth year, so they're like having a bunch of, coming up to graduate, they're doing culmination projects of their own devising, like that still was from Dave's game that he's working on, and a couple other students are working on. And one, they keep changing around their project, they're using like the Oculus Rift, uh, doing a two-player game where each player has a different view and so, into the same world. So um, so the, the, each, each student is able to then sort of shape it into what they do, but it does have to be guided along the way. If you sort of throw them in and like, good luck, they'll drown. You know, there's a lot to, a lot of uh, mazes of twisty little passages you can get lost in in there. But with help and guidance, it's a great environment because they start exploring. Like the, I, the students constantly find things that I have no idea about. Like in Blender, I, you know, there's a ton of stuff in there that they'll just show up with like some modeling or animation trick. That I'm like, could you teach me that? And that's that's a, that's a good moment. Like I feel like I've taught them something when they're starting to teach me stuff back. So, but yeah, definitely the like processing and Arduino environments and things like that are great beginner ones, but once you've got going, since everything's, well not everything, but most of the interface is all written in, in Python all the way through, it becomes a good environment to start customizing and modifying it. And I think that's really the thing that I want them to take away from it is that it's code, you, it's written by people, you can be one of those people, and in fact you're going to be one of those people if you want to pass my class. So, um, any other questions or anything? Anybody out there? Did a high speed rant people here, but uh, so it's uh, my first time here at the uh, Blender conference. So I've been really excited to get to see everybody first day or anything. But uh, it's been uh, you know, I've been using Blender for several years now. Yes, uh, I don't think so. Maybe I'm not certain. Right up. No, I think I'm supposed to just. Maybe? Yeah, I think I'm just supposed to repeat back what you say. So. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's something. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, I'm teaching Blender for. Uh, they are between 13 and 16, mm -hmm. and I have absolutely no hope that they'll ever learn any code. Mm -hmm. So I was actually, I was actually very surprised when you uh, told me here that you're actually. It, it sounded like you're mostly concentrating on Blender code, actually, on Blender Python. On the, that's what we try to get them up to. I mean, like they, they if if they're having if they want to learn like some of the basic concepts and stuff, the Blender game engine is also nice because of its use of like the logic bricks system, the sensor controller, actuator models, nice and sort of formalized and has them doing code like things without a lot of yeah. syntax. So that's also been a good place to kind of get them to warm up to it, and then they can start introducing more Python code as controllers once they get a little bit more skilled. Some of them don't get there. I mean, some of them yeah, really yeah. take it up. Yeah. The guy who did the course before me said he was using the game engine with his students. All he did was he made the games, the students played them, and when the students got bored, they went online. So yeah, <laughs> that, that probably not the so best pedagogical message. I came into a class that was supposed to learn computer games, and they just knew the, Firefox. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely trying to go over modeling with them, and. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think like that, those basic concepts like the idea that you can simulate something with the computer and that you can modify that and stuff are... are yeah, that's the part they really like. Yeah. But, um, so, would you recommend to actually dismiss the modeling part? Or um, I mean, them, it, depends on, it depends on the focus of it. Yeah. I mean, I do a little bit of, of teaching them modeling just, just so they can understand like a 3D coordinate space because they'll need yeah. that or they're going to do other things in it. Yeah. But I'm not trying to primarily crank out 3D modelers just because there's not a lot of jobs for, you know, I can make a cube and I can duplicate it. doesn't get you very far, whereas I know a little bit of coding gets you, you can get jobs with that. So okay, yeah. relative employability kind of things. But yes? Just a um, question. Uh, you're, so your students appear to be very technically interested and they, they actually want to do coding. Mm. Okay. Um, they, they all enrolled in a college of technology. It says so on the outside of the building. So I assume that they, uh, I see. No, okay. but they, they don't yeah. often know what that really means, to be quite honest, at least some of them. I mean, some of my kids come in and are really brilliant, but they're all, all self-selected for some sort of technology background. Yeah. My English isn't the best, so um, undergraduate students, what age group is that? They would be uh, about 18 to 22. Ah, okay. So yeah, they're getting bachelor's degrees. Um, most of my well, sorry, my students are 18 to 
58 or something. I mean, like, there's some, some older students in there. Um, very few of our students graduate in four years. Often they take five or six if they graduate at all. We have high dropout rates, and those are not related to, like, class performance, unfortunately. Some of my best students have just, you know, a family member has become ill, and they had to, like, go back to Ecuador and take care of their grandmother kind of thing. Like, that kind of stuff happens a lot. Um, so I can't really, like, rubric my way, right, like, better course plans and work around that, I, other than finding large amounts of money to give them, which I still haven't figured out how to work that out. But, uh, but yeah, they're like, uh, you know, they're, they're college students, 18, 22, mm -hmm. and up. Uh, most of them have had some, uh, I would say most, most of them have seen a computer um, and, and use their cell phones a lot. Very few of them come in with any programming background, except for like one or two out of any given class who would come in having done a lot of stuff. So there's a really wide, like, like audio kind of thing, there's like a high dynamic range that in, in technical ability. And a lot of them come in sorely lacking in basic like math or reading skills. So uh, we often have to spend a lot of time working on like, like with the, the 3D modeling stuff, like what are the X, Y, and Z axes, and what does that mean, that kind of stuff. So um, we end up teaching a lot of basic applied 3D math as, as along with it, even though they take other math classes, just to kind of get them up to where they're at. Thank you. Cool. Anyone? Anyone? Oh, one over there. Um, I've heard about people discussing uh, here in the Netherlands mm -hmm. um, the introduction of programming classes at a very young age, mm -hmm. uh, what we call lower school, so mm -hmm. that's before the age of 12. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Um, I think it's definitely a good idea to like introduce and everybody to programming, and I think that the if somebody really wants to study it, they should be able to. I think the the idea that somehow that will turn everybody into a computer scientist who will make huge amounts of money is not true, and that's kind of how it gets framed in the U.S. There's often this idea that like if we just had a you know, if we take ten-year-olds to do some programming, they'll all become millionaires, and, yeah, and that's I, not going to work. I think this is more from a perspective of computers become more and more important in our society, yeah. and on the other hand, it becomes easier to use. So you have to know less. Yeah, and they try to counter that by introducing this knowledge about how this stuff actually works. That is so important in our society. Yeah, I, I think that, that a lot of as software becomes easier to use. You don't need to understand anything about how it works. You sort of take it as a given that you sort of click on some stuff on your phone and things happen and pictures get posted to the internet or whatever. And that, you know, they, they don't, I used to hear people talk about like, you know, digital natives versus, you know, like the people who have grown up with technologies. My students are not at any great advantage having had a cell phone that they can click on some stuff as far as programming goes or as far as making things. So, uh, in fact, sometimes they're, they're kind of at disadvantage of that. So. So I think being able to actually get exposed to that earlier would help if they got exposed to it in a way that wasn't just, and now you get bored and go play on the internet, which is how a lot of those classes seem to happen for, for those. So yeah, it's, they're, they're actually talking about learning them. Yeah, language. yeah. And like, the, now, at that age, we teach them English. Yep. Well, why not include Python right, in, in right. the language? Right. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a sort of basic literacy idea that that's, that's yeah. useful. Also, programming can be a great way to teach other, get students to be interested in other things. If you can be able to build models and, and manipulate those, those can make it a more of active learning process. Being able to teach like music and, and those sort of concepts through through programming tools can be, it can be a way of reaching other students who might be, be turned off by just sort of, I have to memorize a bunch of stuff. Like they can make a thing and tinker around with it. I know that was kind of the, the sort of kid that I was. I mean, I was taking things apart and stuff. So like I didn't really pay attention to my math classes because they didn't really, I, I had to memorize how to do stuff and it was only like years later I'm like, wait, that sine, cosine stuff, I can make video games with that. That was never made clear to me when as a kid. I would have paid a lot more attention if that oh, would have yes. helped. Same, same yeah, for me. yeah so, so I think if, if they can do that early on, they'll help. There was a question over? Oh. Uh, I'm teaching uh, primary school uh, age kids mm -hmm. uh, programming with Scratch. Mm -hmm. Scratch from MIT, yep. Yep. which is a mm -hmm. visual programming tool and it works perfectly just to give them the mindset to start to think like a programmer or, yeah. or a storyteller and uh, whatever they, they can do a lot with it. So, yeah, yeah, that's a nice uh, start up before you go into Blender. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's definitely a lot of like projects like Scratch, Trinket's another one that has the code blocks things. They're going there's a there's several things that make it sort of easier to you're not memorizing a bunch of syntax, but you're getting these ideas of like there are things that take inputs, perform processes, and do outputs, and maybe you should learn about those. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, 
I also use Scratch and Color Dojos uh, throughout Belgium, mm -hmm. and we also use Arduino yeah, yeah. and uh, Makey Makey, yeah. uh, Lego Mindstorms, yeah. and it's really cool to see those young kids really active with it. The, so, the, do you do? Do you yeah, guys I, use that also? Yeah, I teach. I teach the physical computing class, which uses Arduino, and I, I really find that being able to make a thing you can touch that does stuff really reaches another set of kids that would be like, uh, is this stuff on screen? I want to pay attention to it, which kind of would, was me also at that, at that age. So being able to like make things that move around and do stuff and respond to the physical environment, I think is a great way of getting engagement there. Also, that you can be able to kind of understand what's going on. And well, I really like you moving from like having stuff with like physical objects, like physical computing things, to Blender is that kind of sensor controller actuator model carries through through both areas. So there's this high level abstract idea of we're going to read from some sensors, make some decisions about it, and then change the world with some actuators, and there'll be a feedback loop that may, lets them both make their Arduino projects and make games in Blender. So I've got a couple kids who are in both of my, my uh, interactive 3D class and the uh, uh, physical computing class this semester, and both of them come up to be like. This, we have the same homework assignments in both classes. Wait, like it's the same stuff, just presented through two radically different environments. So that kind of repetition and being able to see this as a big idea is, is really key and really helpful. Have you been working with uh, Blender and Arduino? Um, like, we've gotten some students who've made some, uh, we've been working on some projects to try to integrate them together, like we'd be able to you know, send some simple sensors there's and an stuff. an exporter, a Pi exporter normally? So that you can use the game engine and uh, have the direction to the Arduino and do stuff, make lights um, go on. And I, I haven't, I haven't gone that direction. I've mostly gone with like having Arduino projects that send data into like a, a Blender world. You turn knobs and these, and they attach those to some parameters that way. I haven't gone logic bricks back, which would be kind of neat though, because I really do like the sensor controller actuator model. It's a nice formal engineering, you know, goes back to control systems theory, cybernetic stuff. You know, there's there's some, some serious thought that's been put into that, and having students think rigorously about the design of objects and systems in that way is really key, I think, for them to be able to actually understand them. So being able to use that in multiple classes has really paid off, because the first time through, if they're like, no, I'll memorize it for the test and then I'll forget about it, but the second time through when they they start realizing that idea that they learned early on applies to a different domain, then they take it more seriously. So yeah, so I, I like the combination of virtual world, but also world world. You know, like those are, I think, ways of making those things really real to them. There's somebody else over that way, possibly? Yeah, the microphone wrangling. Um, I, I was actually just gonna, um and find out what other people's opinions were about uh, sort of secondary level education um, because we're sort of experiencing the same thing in the UK at the moment with a big push on uh, computer science education and so my daughter's like 13 at the moment and uh, they'll be actually teaching Python with Blender mm -hmm. at that age mm -hmm. uh, and I was curious to see how um, it, everybody else's experience was and start out with Scratch exactly mm -hmm. the same as, as somebody already mentioned and then moving across to things like uh, Python and Blender mm -hmm. so at the moment I mean <laughs> Um, I work in university education as, as well, mm -hmm. and um, we're kind of a little bit, mm -hmm. it's going to become harder because obviously the kids who are at that age now, when they come through to university education, they're going to be actually quite more advanced than our current students are. Right. Um, so I think that could make quite a big impact um, yeah. on, on, on the sort of education sector as a whole. Yeah, I, so I, my question in a way was actually answered by everybody talking about yeah. it beforehand. So, yeah, yeah. but yeah, I, I think that like with with my students, my biggest regrets usually is that I could, didn't get to talk to them like when they were in junior high school and kind of steer them towards things that would have actually interested them. Like a lot of them come in with such deficits in like basic mathematical skills or basic just sort of quantitized reasoning kinds of stuff and or reading skills for that matter. So if they can be introduced to them earlier, I think that will put them in a much better case to learn whatever the thing that will be there in, you know, whatever the, you know, Blender 5.0 or whatever, I don't know, whatever the thing in the future. So, um, but they, I think that they definitely, if they can be taught basic things early on, that helps. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, uh, mm. uh, in the UK, it sort of stems from the fact that sort of uh, early computer education was really just Word and Excel, and that was about it. Um, you know, so um, there's this really big push on it now to actually, you know, get kids into programming and the sort of associated soft skills as well. So. Yeah, like I, we, we even had a, in my college, there were still like these computer classes that were like learning to do like Excel sheets and stuff like that was, you know, the the extent of it. And like they're coming up with like a bachelor's degree and that like, uh, makes yeah. part of my soul die thinking about that. So I'm glad to see them getting steered towards more stuff. The big thing that 
I worry about with some of these is they still want them to kind of color inside the lines of whatever they're doing as opposed to view computation as a creative medium which they can express themselves in. And even if they're learning cool tools like Scratch and things like that at 13, if they're learning to type in the example as told to them and it runs without errors and that's all that they care about, then they've learned basically nothing. So, so they still have to be you know, getting this idea of like, code's a thing that people write and I can be one of those people and that would be a good thing. So. Any, anyone else? Anyone? People looking around there. I've been the end of a long day here, but I'm really glad to get to come here and talk to people about education and learning and things like that, which is one of the things I've liked about the Blender community from the beginning. So, uh, thanks everybody. Um, <laughs> I have no idea how to turn this mic off. So.